in front, chapter 4, pages 65 to 74. We go back. It is time we return to the lorries. The sky has become brighter, 3 o'clock in the morning. The breeze is fresh and cool. The pale hour makes our faces look gray. We trudge onward in single file through the trenches and shell holes and come again to the zone of mist. Kazensky is restive. That's a bad sign. What's up, cat? says Krop. I wish I were back home. Home. He means the huts. We'll soon be out of it, cat. He is nervous. I don't know. I don't know. We come to the communication trench and then to the open fields. The little wood reappears. We know every foot of ground here. There's the cemetery with the mounds and the black crosses. That moment it breaks out behind us, behind us, swells, roars, and thunders. We duck down. A cloud of flame shoots up in a hundred yards ahead of us. The next minute, under a second explosion, part of the wood rises slowly in the air. Three or four tree trees sail up and then crash to pieces. The shells begin to hiss like safety valves. Heavy fire. Take cover, yells somebody. Cover! The, front, the fields are flat. The wood is too distant and dangerous. The only cover is the graveyard and the mounds. We stumble across in the dark, and as though he had been spat there, every man lies glued behind a mound. Not a moment too soon. The dark goes mad. It heaves and raves. Darkness blacker than the night rush on us with giant strides over us and away. The flames of the explosions light up the graveyard. There is no escape anywhere. By the light of the shells, I try to get a view of the fields. They are, surging, they are a surging sea. Daggers of flame from the explosions leak up like fountains. It is impossible for anyone to break through it. The wood vanishes. It is pounded, crushed, torn to pieces. We must stay here in the graveyard. The earth bursts before us. It rains clods. I feel a smack. My sleeve is torn away by a splinter. I shut my fist. No pain. Still, that does not reassure me. Wounds don't hurt until afterwards. I feel the arm all over. It is grazed but sound. Now a crack on the skull. I begin to lose consciousness. Like lightning, the thought comes to me. Don't faint! I sink down in the black broth and immediately come up to the top again. A splinter slashes into my helmet, but has already traveled so far that it does not go through. I wipe the mud out of my eyes. A hole is, turned up in, is torn up in front of me. Shells hardly ever land in the same hole twice. I'll get into it. With one lunge, I shoot as flat as a fish over the ground. There it whistles again. Quickly, I crouch together, claw for cover feel something on the left. A sho I shove in beside it. It gives way. I groan. The earth leaps. The blast thunders in my ears. I creep under the yielding thing, cover myself with it, draw it over me. It is wood, cloth, cover, cover, miserable cover against the whizzing splinters. I open my eyes. My fingers grasp a sleeve. An arm? A wounded man? I yell to him. No answer. A dead man. My hand gropes farther, splinters of wood. Now I remember again that we are lying in the graveyard. But the shelling is stronger than everything. It wipes out the sensibilities. I merely crawl still farther under the coffin. It shall protect me, though death himself lies in it. Before me gapes the shell hole. I grasp it with my eyes as with fists. With one leap, I must be in it. There I get a smack in the face. A hand clamps onto my shoulder. Has the dead man waked up? The hand shakes me. I turn my head. In the second of light, I stare into the face of Kazensky. He has his mouth wide open and is yelling. I hear nothing. He rattles me. Comes nearer. In a momentary lull, his voice reaches me. Gas! 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 Pass it on. I grab for my mask. Gas mask. Page 68. Some distance from me, there lies someone. I think of nothing but this. The fellow there must know. Gas! Gas! I call. I lean toward him. I swipe at him with the satchel. He doesn't see me. Once again, again, he merely ducks. It's a recruit. I look at Cat desperately. He has his mask on. I pull out mine, too. My helmet falls to one side. It slips over my face. I reach the man. His satchel is on the side nearest me. I seize the mask. Pull it over his head. He understands. 
I let go and with a jump drop into the shell hole. The dull thud of the gas shells mingles with the crashes of the light explosives. A bell sounds between the explosions, gongs, and metal claps, clappers, warning everyone, gas, gas, gas. Someone plums down behind me. Another, I wipe the goggles of my mask clear of the moist breath. It is cat, crop, and someone else. All four of us lie there in heavy, watchful suspense and breathe as lightly as possible. Their first minute, these first minutes with the mask decide between life and death. Is it airtight? I remember the awful sights in the hospital, the gas patients who in day-long suffocation cough up their burnt lungs in clots. Cautiously, the mouth applied to the valve, I breathe. The gas still creeps over the ground and sinks into all hollows like a big, soft jellyfish. It floats into our shell hole and lolls there obscenely. I nudge Cat. It is better to crawl out and lie on top than to stay where the gas collects most. But we don't get as far as that. A second bombardment begins. It is no longer as though shells roared. It is the earth itself raging. With a crash, something but black bears down on us. It lands close behind us, a coffin thrown up. I see Cat move and I crawl across. The coffin has hit the fourth man in our hole on his outstretched arm. He tries to tear off his gas mask with the other. Crop sees him just in time. Twists the hand sharply behind his back and holds it fast. Cat and I proceed to free the wounded arm. The coffin lid is loose and bursts up. We are, the e we are easily able to pull it off. We toss the corpse out. It slides down to the, b to the bottom of the shell hole. Then we try to loosen the under part. Fortunately, the man swoons and Crop is able to help us. We no longer have to be careful, but work away till the coffin gives with a sigh before the spade that we have dug in under it. It has grown lighter. Cat takes a piece of the lid, places it under the shattered arm, and we wrap all our bandages around it. For the moment, we can do no more. Page 70. Inside the gas mask, my head booms and roars. It is night bursting. My lungs are tight. They breathe always the same hot, used-up air. The veins on my temples are swollen. I feel I am suffocating. A gray light filters through to us. I climb out over the edge of the shell hole. In the, dirt, in the dirty twilight lies a leg torn clean off. The boot is quite whole. I take that all in at a glance. Now something stands up a few yards distant. I polish the windows in my excitement. They are immediately dimmed again. I peer through them. The man there no longer wears his mask. I wait some seconds. He has not collapsed. He looks around and makes a few paces. Rattling in my throat, I tear my mask off too and fall down. The air streams into me like cold water. My eyes are bursting. The wave sweeps over me and extinguishes me. The shelling has ceased. I turn toward the crater, beckoning to the others. They take off their masks. We lift up the wounded man one taking his splintered arm, and so we stumble off hastily. The graveyard is a mass of wreckage. Coffins and corpses, top of page 71, lie strewn about. They have been killed once again, but each of them that was flung up saved one of us. The hedge is destroyed. The rails of the light railway are torn up and rise stiffly in the air in great arches. Someone lies in front of us. We stop. Crop goes on alone with, that, with the wounded man. The man on the ground is a recruit. His hip is covered with blood. He is so exhausted that I feel from my water bottle where I have rum and tea. Cat restrains my hand and stoops over him. Where's it got you, comrade? His eyes move. He is too weak to answer. We slit open his trousers carefully. He groans. Gently, gently. It is much better. If he has been hit in the stomach, he oughtn't to drink anything. There's no vomiting. That's a good sign. We lay the hip bare. It is one mass of mincemeat and bone splinters. The joint has been hit. This lad won't walk anymore. I wet his temples with a moistened finger and give him a swig. His eyes move again. We see now that the right arm is bleeding as well. Cat spreads the out two wads of dressing as wide as possible so that they will cover the wound. 
I look for something to bind loosely around it. We have nothing more. So I slip up the wounded man's trousers legs still farther in order to use a piece of his underpants as a baggage, as a bandage. But he is wearing none. Page 72. I now look at him closely. He is the fair-headed boy of a little while ago. In the meantime, Cat has taken a bandage from a dead man's pocket, and we carefully bind the wound. I say to the youngster, who looks at us fixedly, We're going for a stretcher now. Then he opens his mouth and whispers, Stay here. We'll be back again soon, says Cat. We are only going to get a stretcher for you. We don't know if he understands. He whimpers like a child and plucks at us. Don't go away. Cat looks around and whispers, Shouldn't we just take a revolver and put an end to it? The youngster will hardly survive the carrying, and at the most, he will only last a few days. What he has gone through so far is nothing to what he's in for till he dies. Now he is numb and feels nothing. In an hour, he will become one screaming bundle of intolerable pain. Every day that he can live will be a howling torture. And to whom does it matter whether he has them or not? I nod. Yes, cat. We ought to put him out of his misery. He stands still a moment. He has made up his mind. We look round, but we are no longer alone. A little group is gathering from the shell holes and trenches of pure heads. We get a stretcher. Cat shakes his head. Such a kid. He repeats it. Young innocence. Page 73. Our losses are less than was to be expected. Five killed and eight wounded. It was, in fact, quite a short bombardment. Two of our dead lie in the upturned graves. We merely throw the earth in on them. We go back. We trot off silently in single file, one behind the other. The wounded are taken to the dressing station. The morning is cloudy. The bears make a fuss about numbers and tickets. The wounded whimper. It begins to rain. An hour later, we reach our lorries and climb in. There is more room now than there was before. The rain becomes heavier. We take out waterproof sheets and spread them over our heads. The rain rattles down and flows off at the sides and streams. The lorries bump through the holes, and we rock to and fro in a half-sleep. Two men in the front of the lorry have long fork poles. They watch for telephone wires which hang crosswise over the road so low that they might easily pull our heads off. The two fellows take them at the right moment on their poles and lift them over behind us. We hear their, mu- we hear their call, Mind! Wire! Dip the knee in a half-sleep and straighten up again. Monotonously the lorries sway. Monotonously comes the call- come the calls. Monotonously falls the rain. It falls on our heads and on the heads of the dead up on the line, on the body of the little recruit with the wound that is much too big for his hip. It falls on Kimrick's grave. It falls in our hearts. An explosion sounds somewhere. We wince. Our eyes become tense. Our hands are ready to vault over the side of the lorry into the ditch by the road. Nothing happens. Only the monotonous cry. Mind. Wire. Our knees bend. We are again half asleep. <laughs>